today we're going to, to talk about a um, very interesting uh, part of the Parsha. I know this is, uh, this is Yair's uh, Bar Mitzvah Parsha, so he usually spoke about it. There is a lot of uh, interesting uh, parts in it, like uh, Shemitah and all kind of uh, Yovel, all kind of very interesting things. But since I didn't know what he did in previous years, I decided to look for something that I was sure he didn't do. Uh, so here we are. Um, so I call it stopping the slippery slope. Uh, and you will see in a second why. Okay, so we have the regular uh, housekeeping rules. Gabe, do you want to say something about it? To make you know, um, really productive and fruitful, we really want to stay on the topic. So today, you know, in your breakout rooms when you're together, just have in the back of your mind that you want to stay in the reading. You know, we do this all year, so there's always time to go into other readings. Uh, but we want to stay on the topic today that uh, that we're we're talking about. So anything in the parsha reading is fair game. Um, everything outside the parsha, be very exercise judgment, you know, as to as to what to to bring in. So. Um, we'd love all of you to, you know, make an effort to contribute your thoughts. We want to hear you speak. That's what makes you know I'm great is that we talk, we share, we, you know, it's not just one person talking down to 15 other people. It's really 15 people coming together and experiencing uh, the Hebrew scriptures, the Torah together. And um, we also, uh, any, you know, if you want to bring in personal stories, those are excellent, but make sure that they're related to the portion. Again, we're talking about staying on topic. This is something we don't have a lot of time in the session, and we really want to stay on topic. Um, now, we are a mixed community here. We got Christians and Jews together. And so, you know, I I'm a Christian, and as a Christian, when I'm sharing, when I'm in the context of other people who don't share, you know, my, my Christian convictions, if I share personal stories or a, a perspective that I know is inherently Christian, it's really important that I share it in a way that I own it. You know, I, I, it's a Christian view. And so it's, I, I will introduce what I'm sharing, if it's a Christian idea, as a Christian view. And the reason we do that when we're in, in a uh, mixed company like this is you're not forcing other people to feel like you're, 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 you're implying that they agree with you because if they're, you know, if they're Orthodox Jews, for example, they won't agree with you on all the theological ideas as I'm speaking to Christians right now. And then we have the flip side where, you know, when Orthodox Jews, uh, Jews in general, I'm going to pick on Orthodox Jews for a second, you know, they might have traditions, uh, maybe some things that are Kabbalistic, uh, things that uh, Christians uh, really have no connection to or just they don't agree with. It can be awkward for Christians to feel like, things are being shared that they don't know about, they don't understand, and they don't agree with. And so it's good to just to really clearly identify if you're talking about something that really only applies uh, to the best of your own knowledge, to your community of faith. So I think that covers all of our housekeeping. Yonatan, take yeah. it away. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, okay, so we have a very interesting uh, four different um, parts in this Parsha. Um, and I brought all four, they, they, are, they are in order in the Parsha, um, and they are talking about uh, somebody who is, uh, somebody from your family who is in some kind of financial trouble, and, and what happens to him. And there is, there is four different degrees, um, and there is all kind of uh, ways uh, uh, for us, the Torah said it's an it's a, it's, it's a obligation for us to help him, to save him, uh, and so on. Um, so I, I brought in the four, the four, uh, um, the four different uh, stages, and they go from um, like light to very hard in terms of like what happened to the person. Okay, so the first situation, for example, is a person who has less money. Um, I'll read the verse: "Ve'ki yamu chachicha ve'machar me'achuzato uba go'alo akarov elav ve'ga'al et mimkar achiv." Okay, so. If somebody he's, he's losing his money, he lost his money. He he's selling his estate or part of his estate, part of his uh, part of his like um, inherited uh, uh, you know grounds. Um, so his brother or or somebody close to him needs to help him and redeem it. Um, so that's the first case, and I, I brought in the the rest of the of the verses regarding this situation. And then the second case uh, that's it's, it's, it goes one step. Uh, further, um, if somebody is, is in even worse situation, uh, so you have to like you have to already let him stay with you, and you have to take take charge of him. 
uh, and you cannot, uh, you cannot like you, you need to give him money and you cannot um, take interest on the, that money. So that's the second situation. And the, all those four situations, what's connected them is they use this special phrase, Veki yamuch achicha, if your king being in straits. I'm not sure how, how to pronounce it in English, um, but it's a very, it's a very unique, uh, it's a very unique um, um, phrase. And it, it appears in the parasha four times in four different situations. Um, and then number three, the situation gets a little bit worse. Um, what happened if you know, the situation is so bad that your brother or your relative is uh, being sold as a slave uh, and, and he's sold to you as a slave? What are you allowed or, or not allowed to do um, with him as a slave? And again, um, you're not allowed to use him like in a very hard situation. You're not allowed to like, abuse him and you know, all kinds of things that we think as a slave, you're not allowed to do. He's basically some kind of like a regular worker almost, you can say. And then the last situation um, is what happened if the situation is so bad that not only he's sold to as a slave, but he's not even sold to you or, or to another Jew. He's, he's sold to somebody who is a girl who is a, an alien, somebody who is a, a resident in the country, but he's not a Jew. He's sold like out of, he's like totally lost, he's out of the system. And again, it's your responsibility to redeem him um, and, and, and help him. So that's the four different situations. Um, and after that, I have, I, I made two slides. The first one of them is kind of just um, bringing everything together a bit, um, just the first paragraph of, of each one. So it will be easier just to look and compare if you don't want to look on the, on the whole verse. Um, you have the, all the four different situations, um, Hebrew and English. And then the second one, which is something that is not, I didn't put before, that is what, what is God's answer to e or what is God's request in each one of the situation? So for example, in the first situation, if you are selling a parcel you're holding, there is really no explanation from God. It's just, he's telling you to do it. Um, but in the second situation where he is already has to live under your control, um, sorry, how do I go back? Okay. Um, so God says, Ani Adonai Elohim. So I am, I am your God that I took you out of Egypt and gave you the land of Canaan. In the, third, in the third situation, um, that is, it's more severe. Also, God's response is more severe. Um, and he's saying, third, third situation is a situation where he's a slave in, in your home. So God is saying, Ki avadai hem asher So the Jewish people are my slaves. I took them out of, out of Egypt. They should not be sold and, as a slave. So you, sh you cannot, you know, work him uh, too hard. And then the first situation, which, which is where he's sold as a slave to a non-Jew and you are obligated to redeem him, says, Ki li bnei Israel avadim, they are my slaves. Asher otzeti otam eretz Mitzrayim, I am the Lord your God. Um, so if, quite similar to number three, but there is also a little bit of uh, differences. So that's all the different verses. And then uh, we have a few questions. Um, and I want, I, I want to add two questions that are kind of, I think, um, like they're not specific questions, are more of like the general, I think, uh, um, the general picture questions. Um, so one is, what is the real issue? Meaning, why do we really need to help those people? Why is God, what is God afraid of? Like, why, is it, why do we have to, to go through all this trouble? Uh, and the other question is, why is it coming back? Meaning, if, if we obeyed God and helped the person in the beginning, in the first situation, then it will never come you know, to the second situation or to the third situation, but it's, it's keep coming back, right? So what does that mean? Um, so that's just two general questions, kind of a bigger picture questions. Um, and that's it. That's my, uh, that's my part. All right. I think then that's good food for thought as we uh, split off into our groups. Glad to uh, dig into this.
Welcome everybody back to the main room. We're back together. Hope all of you had a really good discussion. We uh, want to start sharing together the things that we discussed. We just, sorry, Eve uh, was just sharing her thought about this question about, you know, God being ethnic and caring about groups of people and families. Eve, thank you for sharing that uh, just as we wrapped up the, um, the session, the, the breakout room. So does anybody want to uh, start us off? Is there anything that stood out to you in what you were saying in your room? Like, is there something exciting you? Well, one of the things that David said, which I think really stood out, was how the word that repeats itself throughout this parsha more than any other word is related to redemption. It's all about redemption. The entire, all of these matters uh, of helping, of, of feeling a responsibility to redeem everyone. And then everybody has that feeling to redeem everyone else. This sense of responsibility for the redemption of all is just so powerful. And these, the four examples that Yonatan brought are, uh, um, are four examples. And that's where Moshe mentioned something really so beautiful that they're the, the, the expression of that you should be fearful of God <clears throat> appears in only five places in the Torah, and they're all in this parsha, and they're all cases where people are responsible in, in, in relating to cases where people have to help take care of other people, and uh, typically people who are disadvantaged, so it's easy to take advantage of them, and God is essentially saying, look, um, I know exactly what your motivations are, whether you're trying to take advantage of the person or whether you're trying to be like like I want you to be, or like me, which means to to help, truly help the other person in the way that he needs help so that he won't go down the slippery slope. So um, those are the cases, the only five cases where the Torah says, you know, uh, be fearful of me because I want you to not just do the right thing, but I want you to do it with the right motivation. So if we want to redeem, we have to redeem others also with the right motivation. That's two very, two very profound thoughts that came up in our meeting. One of the questions that came up was how far should one go in helping? Because sometimes when you help people without empowering them, then they get an empowerment, uh, an entitlement mentality. So that way you're not quite helping them. Uh, case in point, when you look at national level among governments, I'll give an example of Africa, which has many governments have received foreign aid, but and continue to do so. But when you try to mm -hmm. translate how effective this aid has been in empowering the people, uh, it still raises questions uh, and. Uh, even when you look at the, the local setting, you find people looking to the government always to come and intervene and, and pay or bail them out. But when we look at what the Torah teaches, uh, the other thing that stood out, Kim mentioned that you see God putting that responsibility on families, not not the government or the state, which was quite um, quite insightful. And then helping us as return to that family responsibility in the community to always look out for the other as our brother's keepers. Well, one of the points we brought up uh, on the question about how far do you take it, I, I cited the historical Jewish experience in Europe where Jews were often kidnapped by the authorities and held for ransom and basically held the Jewish communities to a ransom threat. Um, and one of the famous rabbis, I believe in Regensburg, um, was incarcerated and an outrageous sum was demanded of the Jewish community and he himself issued a Pesach Din to limit what should be spent and anything beyond a certain amount was to be rejected and not responded to. So 
uh, our experience to helping out a fellow uh, man is limited by certain realities um, where other people take uh, advantage of that mutual sense of dependency that we have. Um, and this was an interesting situation because this rabbi was not invoking any entitlement. Uh, and he realized that this would become a pattern of oppression uh, if allowed to keep uh, happening. So he basically took himself out of the loop and was willing to stay in jail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one, one thought that to me, uh, Alan, I'm just playing off uh, again, that, that we talked about um, was this idea that there's an element of the group of people really having uh, an identity of being a tribe, of being a collective, of being family. And you reinforce that idea of like family we are. And then there's a responsibility, there's a moral responsibility, an ethical um, uh, requirement that members within the family have to release, this is my words now, uh, you know, have to release the good things that are inside of them into the family and into the community. And that's where you're creating value. So you might have mathematical skill, right? So you release your capacity to do math and calculate. You release your ability to plant and to make food. You release your ability to write poetry, to create music. And when you become, uh, what's the word? Is it yamuch? Um, ki yamuch? Alecha, like when someone becomes poor and depressed and they're not able to release anymore the value that God has put inside of them, like there's a blockage that happens that we need to use the family's wealth. We need to use the family's strength to unblock that person so that they can return to that healthy contribution of releasing. And, and that, it, to me, it's kind of stood out this moral responsibility because this is important when we're talking about the... Um, uh, you were saying, uh, Edward, about the um, uh, entitlement mentality. There's a blockage where I don't have to give anymore. Like you lose that moral imperative of like, no, you actually have a responsibility to pour out of yourself what God has put inside of you, your capacity, your ability to work, your ability to release uh, effort and labor into the world. And so, you know, we have to carry that. No, I need to, I need to put upon my shoulder the burden of I'm responsible to release what God has put inside of me. And then my family is, is, is responsible to help me be able to do that, you know, sometimes through lending money without interest, right? Sometimes by redeeming me and my family and my children, things like that. Something we did with the Syrian family. And uh, just what has been said that it is a process. It's a process in helping these people because of their thinking. And so... Like you said, it's a community. Like my husband helped in one aspect of what he could do. And then another fella came along and he also helped in, in, in helping the man to do with the finances to understand because in Canada, uh, when you come to Canada, you end up getting this sort of baby bonus. And so you're given money for each child. So then they've never been given that. So they don't know what to do with it, how to handle it. They don't realize to set aside or they could save some of it. Or... So anyways, it's just a process we found with the Syrian family that was brought over. Uh, and, you know, we're still in contact with the, It took two years and they were, you know, able to have a home. And he's now got his own business. But, you know, we're still in contact with them. So it's like they're family. You don't leave them alone <laughs> you know and there is boundaries we there was boundaries drawn because of the concepts that are in their their mind that they don't understand so boundaries had to be drawn so that they could uh learn how to manage finances so i just want to add that oh thank you lily i wanted to push this thought that they came from egypt we do not know how amorphous their life had become in Egypt or whether they had lost to some extent a sense of, because now they are surviving their slaves and, and then now they are coming out and there is a certain formulation that is happening. And maybe there was even a certain element of, okay, I have to survive. I, and, 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 and then they are being formulated back again into tribal groups, in, in, into groupings and families and things. 
And I was trying even to extrapolate it now to our time. Have we reached a place not because of slavery, but um, because of so much emancipation with um, uh, modern living and, 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 and um, lifestyle and being inward looking that we are even falling into the same issue again where we, 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 we could take advantage of, of even our own relatives, where we could even just be looking to ourselves, where we could forget to know that we could come out and, and redeem. And redeem is a huge word. And, and I'm just thinking, so why are we so good now you're trying to teach us something about redemption and the value of, of, of all of this and, and of life um, in yourself, beyond yourself, to people who you are related to in a sense of um, family. But not only that, even the stranger or the disadvantaged in your midst. So my thoughts went sort of in that direction. Beautiful. Thank you. And what I told our group is that um, the whole concept of the Shemitah, um, you know, the, um, uh, uh, the seven-year cycle, because uh, God works in, uh, in seasons. He, um, um, uh, seasons come and seasons go. But he has calibrated it so well uh, for us that we need, we just need to respond to that, uh, uh, to that calibration, to the seasons that he's given. And each one of us should play a, redempt a redemptive role in uh, um, a role in redeeming those who are going down the slippery slope, so to speak. Amen. The superstructure Amen. has been set by Hashem himself. What we need to do is to be obedient and to respond to that superstructure that he's given. Play our redemptive role. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, I think, thank you, Dave. So I think those are good words to, uh, to end on today. So if you permit me, I would like to, to release just two prayers one is that Israel will really release the fullness of this teaching in, in the land, that there will be an understanding to know how to do this, how to release the teachings of Hashem uh, in, this, in this Torah. Mm -hmm. And that also the nations will be able to learn from how Israel is really embracing and, and discovering the goodness of what uh, God has given them so that we can all enjoy it and walk in uh, a greater level of freedom and, and healing, you know, and redemption. So... With that, I wish you all Shavua Tov. Have a great week. Hey, everybody. Shavua Tov. Nations that inhabited the land were those that God tells Abraham in advance 400 years before. He says, they have not honored the, the sanctity of the land. They did not do with the land what God wanted of them. And God gives them another 400 years to uh, possibly turn things around. <clears throat> and they don't turn it around. So essentially, those mm -hmm. seven to ten peoples um, have been uh, deemed by God to not be worthy of staying in the land. And in fact, when we, as the Jewish people, the Israelites, do not do what we're supposed to do with the land, then we're also evicted from the land. Now, if we keep that in mind, we, we, we can understand that when Israel came to the land, those who wanted to stay in the land had only um, two choices. Either they would leave, there's actually three choices, I guess. Either they would leave, <clears throat> or they would fight and with the consequences, or they had a third option of becoming slaves. That third option of becoming slaves was the only acceptable option for those who God had decided to exile, but they really wanted to stay. It's kind of the similar law that we find with the Hebrew slave who decides he wants to stay and he has to, you know, do something with his ear. There, there has to be some kind of, in other words, he really wants to stay despite the fact that God has said, you know, you don't belong here. You had a chance. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. You don't belong in this land. So the slavery 
was essentially their only option. So God, when he says, you know, if you need slaves, take from them, he's basically not introducing them to slavery. He is simply saying, you know, they, they have accepted them to, uh, to become slaves, and therefore, you know, you, you, you have them there for that purpose. Now, we have to understand that slavery in this context is not the same slavery right. that, that, that existed in Egypt. Slavery in this context means that you accept the subservient uh, position. In other words, you're not like an equal citizen. It means that you pay taxes as all the, you know, all the nations at that time, if they had people living amongst them. In fact, when we, when we were conquered by the Romans and others, then we had to pay special taxes to them. In other words, there was some sense of subservience. We see this with a story that Dina is very familiar with called the Giv'onim, when they essentially approached Israel and they said, you know, we came from the long distance and they put on this whole act. And in the end, they have to accept upon themselves the terms that I'm referring to right now. And what did they become? They, they actually became those who who brought water and other things to the temple. They became actually part of the uh, the support system for everything that went on in the temple. So part of, that's part of what it, the you're, slavery you're, is about. Part of it may be a, also a question of definition because Evan has two meanings in that you can translate in English as slave, yeah. but also as servant. That's right. There is an idea of indentured servant. Um, in other words, a person who owed money, he could he could serve, he could work in a family. It's not quite the slavery that we think of, you know, uh, in Africa and uh, America, perhaps. But at the same time, it was also not so much fun. <laughs> For sure. It, it was a choice that they had. But God does the same thing with us. He also tells us, you are to be my servants, right? And we are also obligated and uh, not to do whatever we feel like, but to actually do what God wants of us. To and that's do right. Well. Yeah. Yes, what I'm saying is the same term is used, so it's really much more a mindset of recognizing that you are not. If you want to, call, if you want to do whatever you want to do, you're 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 welcome to leave. If you want to stay in the land of Israel, then you're going to have to fit into the needs of. Um, uh, God's needs of the land. And it turned out, for example, that the Gibonim, they were the ones who had to draw water for the, um, and chop wood and, you know, whatever was necessary. So, so they were able to do something that was actually quite elevated in the end. And we know from the story later on that when they felt that their rights were violated, King David even gave them the privilege of being able to choose how the perpetrators, perpetrator in this case, case King Saul would be punished and they, they had to hang several of his descendants. So we see that it's not, it's, it's not the kind of slavery that we're, we know of in Rome. This is, uh, there, there is a commitment. It goes both ways, um, but, different status. But in the same time, does uh, God does, you know, uh, um, commend us to redeem those slaves as fast as possible? Is God afraid of uh, assimilation if Jewish people become servants to other nations? Eventually, it's going to water down the community. Is that what God's afraid of? That's certainly one of the things that he would, he's mm -hmm. like asserting. Remember the reasons that he gives? He says, for uh, they, they are my servants, so God wants us to serve his purpose in this land, in his land, right? This is his land. He has a very specific purpose for this land. Uh, and it relates to the temple. And uh, he definitely doesn't want other nations to take us to serve their own selfish purposes as many who conquered Israel did. Um, There's also an idea of divine concession to human needs it, it, in many in many laws in other words we were not then uh, at a time when slavery could be abolished people were not ready for this so it had to be refined and said okay i i'm not happy that you're going to take servants or slaves but if you're going to do it then 
will try and do it and get closer to a better ideal. It's like shooting an arrow into the future and saying, ideally, you know, there should be equality. Ideally, there should not be slavery. Ideally, there should not be war. We should not kill animals. Many things. But if this is the real world and we need to do change slowly, then let's try and have these laws as humane as possible, not an ideal. Well, sometimes there are cases where slavery seems to be the only out, way out for someone who's someone <laughs> deeply in debt. He's done, maybe he's even done something that makes him culpable and he owes it's someone. It's better than prison. Then it's better than prison. And we can see, as uh, Jonathan mentioned earlier, that the requirements that uh, are made of somebody who is a master to a Hebrew slave are that he treat them even better than his children. In other words, he has to make sure that they're clothed, that they're fed. Uh, he and, and the verse actually appears there, that he, he becomes like part of his family. It's much more than being just a regular, uh, you know, somebody who works for him. So, so Yair, if that's a situation, what, if that's a situation, so why is it so bad? Meaning, you know, if, I, if I'm a poor person who has no money and no, no, no future, why not be this, you know, slave to a nice person who will take care of me? Like, what's the big deal? Uh, uh, I would love to hear what others have to say about this. I think, I think, I think it's not so much of what God fears is going to happen. It's what he knows will happen. Mm -hmm. There are a number of times in the scriptures where God says, for instance, about the Assyrians, the cup of their indignation is not yet full. I know where they're headed and I have the red line in the sand. And when they cross it, I'll deal with them. And I think he's talking about that same kind of process. I know where this is going and it's not a good thing. And I want you to take steps early to intercept it and change the direction so that it doesn't get you into another Egypt. Could it be also because if I become, if we, anyone, become a slave to a good person, a good, a good master, would that disconnect us from someone little by little from Hashem? Would, would then our connection to God be lesser and lesser as years go by. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's one word that, that uh, says exactly what you just said, which is responsibility. A slave loses a sense of responsibility and initiative because he's always waiting to be told whatever, you know, he has to do. And God wants us to be people who take responsibility, who initiate, who we have to. We have. Our, we have our own calling to fulfill, not just what the master wants to fulfill, and that's such an essential part of our lives. Uh, Christine, I want to add one more thing to what Yair said. I don't think it's only responsibility. I think it's also priority, and I think that I think that's that's maybe what is God like. God responses is like, don't forget, I'm your God. They are my slaves. Meaning you cannot have, you know, one slave cannot have two masters. You need to have one master. I, I think that's part of what God is trying to remind us that, you know, eventually he's the master. Um, you cannot have the slave, um, you know, not do, not do a certain thing that God wants him to do because, you know, he's a slave and he has to work in the whatever. And Jonathan, if you see all of this as a system, as part of a whole community. Right. You spoke about interest as well. Maybe we could see how this fits into a whole community. Moshe, I'd love to hear what you think. Yes. Lily. Well, the, the, the way Jonathan uh, put up the four stages uh, brings uh, up a big question of uh, uh, is God intervening in the economical system in our uh, economy and our social uh, welfare uh, how do we have to deal with uh, all this, the different stages and, and places people find themselves in their uh, 
financial uh, uh, doing uh, and the uh, uh, Hashem's remark of Ani Hashem uh, I am your God again and again and again not only in these things but in all the, the portion itself in all the parasha uh, I think reminds us that we are trying to imitate it and if we are trying to be good as he is good, we have to ask ourselves, uh, what would he do if he would be walking uh, uh -huh. <laughs> between us over here? Right. So if we're trying to be like him, uh, merciful and, uh, and giving and, and, uh, and uh, knowing uh, our problems and so on, it gives us the responsibility to do something. Wow. Now, there's another uh, thing. Maybe we can see. Oh, I'll, I'll mention it in, in two of the uh, commandments, uh, in two of the portions. One with about the interest, and one about the way we deal with the slave or servant. Uh, there is a special uh, saying of Hashem, which says. Uh, you shall fear your God. Uh, it's very interesting to note that in the whole Bible, this uh, phrase, fear your God, appears only five times. It, it, it's, it, it seems as if it should appear more, but only five commandments have the Viarita, the, the fear of God, inside them. Two of them we mentioned, the slave and the taking interest on your loan. And uh, the other three on, are in, in, in these chapters also. Uh, one of them is of uh, uh, taking care of uh, the elderly. And one is, is of the way you deal with the blind. And uh, I do not uh, remember the, the uh, and, uh, and and not cheating your friend. Oh. And these are the only five places. Now, uh, another side of this thing is that when you hear "fear your God," you think that uh, Hashem will tell us this thing with a commandment that has to do something that I have to do towards Him. If I don't do it, sacrifice on this day, or, or do not uh, do something on Shabbos, and, and so on, beware of me. But no, all of the five places that there is fear your God are in the commandments of dealing one with another. The slave, the blind, the, the elderly, and uh, the poor, and so on. And... Uh, one of the ways that uh, you can explain this, uh, commentators uh, talk about it, is that these are commandments that sometimes only you and your heart know what you meant. Mm -hmm. Did you did you mean to take advantage or not? And so on in the different uh, cases uh, with the slave. The, the uh, example is of, of uh, you're going out to, to a trip and uh, giving your servant or slave a work to do that you really don't need it, but you just want to keep him busy. And God says, do not do that. But who knows if you really need the job or do not need the job? You think that only you know in your heart. So this saying of fear your God is saying that he knows what is in your heart. Mm. So, That's so, good. so, so he's roaming around and reading our our hearts, and giving giving us example. Uh, so it's interesting this whole intervening in the uh, economical uh, life. I think that that's so beautiful, and um, it also shows talking about what's in your heart. If you have somebody who's starting to slide down the slippery slope, okay, you know, relating, going back to Jonathan's question, 
The question is, when you start seeing somebody who you feel a responsibility towards, because we're supposed to feel responsible for each other, if you see that happening, how do you help that person not continue to go down the slippery slope? Because, for example, if you give him a handout, then um, he won't necessarily learn to be more, um, you know, to, 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 to do accounting for his finances. He'll just continue doing whatever he's done before, and he'll, again, be needy. He'll, he'll get to the same situation once more. So there seems to be, for example, a priority, if you mentioned priorities, to go ahead and, uh, well, why don't you start by giving him a job if he's not working and he's unable to do the job? Or if he has some limited resources and he needs more for some, you know, really needy person purpose, then give him a loan, but not one with interest that is going to tear him and take him down. Or, and in fact, that loan, according to this Parsha, will even be, um, will, will be, uh, um, uh, how do you say, released. It will be released right. after seven years so that, so that, so that it won't, it won't bring him down forever. It will just weigh on him enough so that he will try to return the loan. Um, in other words, it's, it's really seeking the best way to help a person work things out and not continue sliding down the slope. If he has to start, like the first case is he, he has to sell part of his possessions, then let's make sure that that part that is sold is bought by somebody close to him so that that person can say, well, you know what, why don't you continue working on that piece of land that you just sold to me? You'll, you'll do it for me or, you know, you'll... So it's for him and not for yourself. Right. Exactly. It's much, much more just about really helping the other without your putting yourself in the agenda there. I just wonder, Lily or David, if you would love to hear from you. Well, I, I was thinking along Moshe's line, just that uh, Hashem knows each person individually. And he knows why they're in that place at that time. And uh, I, I believe it's what you've been saying is that um, we have to help that person. Not only do you give him something, but you help him to come out of that uh, situation. And instead of giving interest, which would just put him into more uh, depths of despair, you know, but rather you, you help him financially. And I know that's uh, maybe to understand about finances, uh, maybe how to uh, help him with his crops in the field um, so that he learns, you teach him. And I, and I think that's, that Father's, uh, Hashem's heart is just to always take us to that place where we're, we're learning more about him and his ways of bringing restoration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, here's David. Thank you, Lily. That was really, really good to hear. David, we're happy to see you. Thank you. Um, sorry, I, I was keeping my uh, my video off because it's dinner time here. Um, I've been able to slot it back. Um, just quickly, I, I, I missed some of the introductory remarks and the questions, but basically what I pick up, what I understand about um, this, um, the challenge of, of, of slavery, and um, I think one of the things I've learned over the years about Hashem, about our God, is that um, He works in cycles, or he works in seasons, and uh, the whole concept of um, of uh, the meter is you get cycles coming round. Mm -hmm. uh, people go through seasons of life. A season comes and the season goes. Now, if somebody's found themselves in um, um, say indebted at a certain point. Um, 
there is grace given to come out of that. And that grace, thankfully, is um, sort of well calibrated uh, in the seasons, in the seven-year cycle. And so it is important that when, if you're hitting the climax of one cycle, um, um, say in debt, the seven-year cycle has come, or you're getting into slavery, that we appropriate the grace that comes around, say in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Shemitah year, in the new cycle that is coming, and you leave the old season behind. So what do we do? It's not only the person who is indebted, it's not only the person who's facing slavery, but even the rest of us, because uh, Hashem has given us the responsibility to be redemptive hands, to be to play a redemptive role um, in uh, in uh, in whichever challenge in the challenge of what our brother, our sister, our, uh, is, is facing at that particular time. So, so the cycle um, should be appropriated, and um, we we help out the person, whichever way it is. I've heard about handouts. I think there is a place for handouts. There is a place to help someone get on their feet afresh with, say, capital or with a job or whatever it is. Let us be led by that. But the overall, the, the superstructure of it is that there is grace given at whichever point. Now, how you feel, fit in and fill in in that superstructure will be up to how, what you discern uh, God to be saying at that particular time or for that particular person or the particular moment. Those are my questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I, th I think it connects to a word that really caught my attention, which is to redeem. You, you mentioned it. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, uh, that the land is to be redeemed. And uh, when you look in that verse, you see that the relative is called a redeemer, which means that we are all redeemers. <laughs> I think that's a very nice badge to uh, put on our. Uh, on our I think shirts. that's the word that appears. I think that's the word that appears most in the parasha. Yes. In the entire portion, that word of, of uh, Ga'al, right? Vim lo yigael, and so forth. Redemption is throughout the portion. Which really brings is. us actually to Ruth. And I know Ruth. Yeah. You know, when we're, when we ever we think of that word of redemption, that's so basic to the story of Ruth, and which connects really uh, mercy, kindness, loving kindness, and the land, and family, and charity, all those all those things which are part and parcel of uh, of this of this portion, reminding us that we have our job to do in redemption of the world, not just sitting and waiting for some miracle to happen. I'd like to give an example um, uh, back home. I'm in the U.S. now. Back home, our church brought a Syrian uh, couple uh, with their children to our city. And we had prayed beforehand that the Lord would bring someone whose skills could be used in, in the city. And so they came. And then different people, you know, uh, you know, people helped out as much as they could, individuals in the church. And so my heart, husband played the part because he's in business of, of trying to help uh, this fellow uh, handle money and what to do. Because he was saying, I don't know what to do. They live day to day. They have no idea about uh, putting away for the future. They have no idea about the fact that money comes from the government and mm -hmm. you know, not to spend it right away, but to lay some of it aside. And so um, it was only, not only my husband, but the Lord, but Shem was so good because he brought in uh, another fella to kind of help him too. So this is where the community comes in, not on the whole church, but then another p person, because it took a long time. Now I wanna tell you the good news is this fella, has bought a semi-detached home. He has work now. And uh, so to see that all of the effort together and they're so happy 
to be in a, a land where they're free. Wow. So the community is important. Thank you, Lily, for mentioning that. I, I hope it's okay yet, yet that I mentioned. We had a very interesting night last night. I don't think we slept at all. Uh, we had a fire break oh. out in the community uh, because of the high winds. And there was a um, three o'clock in the morning, we smelled smoke. We went outside. Yeah, here actually, really, I don't want to embarrass you, but he really saved the day, figured out how to get this equipment together and put out the fire before the fire trucks came. Um, and I, together with other people, we were knocking on doors and waking people up and getting them out of the houses. And, uh, but thank God nobody was hurt. And it, it was just really a miracle. I could send you pictures. It was very frightening. But I think, what if we had not been in a community where we care about each other? Um, it's, 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 it's really life-saving. It's not, not just something nice, but we need each other for just to live our lives. And, and thank God we have here rules um, that God has given us to give us life and to make our lives meaningful and, and good, but only if, we're, if we do this together. Mm -hmm. While we're spawning stories, <clears throat> yesterday we were at an open house for somebody who's uh, moving and we met a young man there who's uh, begun a career in uh, as a youth worker in Toronto. And he said that uh, there's certain communities of young people where if they write their address on a job application, they won't get the job because those areas are <clears throat> places where there's a lot of broken families and a lot of <coughs> drug use and uh, they, they really wow. don't get a chance to get out of that cycle because people don't want them coming and working and taking that risk. So what his group did was they uh, created a they, they collaborated with a bunch of NGOs and set up a summer program for these young people so that they could get a job in one of these NGOs or even in rotating from one to the other, getting experience and doing different things. And he said at the end, not everybody, but quite a goodly number of them were actually able to get a job because they had job experience and they had references from the people that they had worked for and showed that they could show up on time and work hard and those kinds of things. So it was really nice to hear that there are people in Toronto caring about these young people who nobody really wants around. So it's wow. comes uh, out of that same idea. Beautiful. Uh, Ruth, I think what you said is is might be the you know the the, the answer to one of the questions of the interest um like what's so bad about the interest right so i think what's bad about the interest is it, it's doing exactly the opposite from what you described now meaning it's somebody who had a chance but now he had he has this baggage of he has to, to give back i don't know how how much every year and you know he's keep in, instead of going up he's sinking you know even lower um i think that's connected to what you just said you know if everybody's helpful why does it keep coming back? Meaning, if we save the person in the beginning, why why is he now in an even worse situation? I think that's an interesting question, which I don't like. I don't necessarily have an answer to. Good question. Uh, Are you talking, Jonathan? Sorry. Excuse me, Jonathan. Oh, the okay. question is the same person. Yeah. Doing... Because okay. if because how that's how did somebody right. became a slave? You know, if if you helped him in the beginning to save his land, so so how. Did, Suddenly he became a slave. Well, I guess maybe it just shows that learning to um, to to be like God, or to be you know as much as we can like God, takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. So, uh, um, but that's exactly the beauty of it. Your question, you know, you're you're talking about a slippery slope, and maybe we have to also experience that slippery slope for us to realize how important it is to take action earlier like you asked in one of your questions mm -hmm. to get things to try to stop things from getting worse uh, as soon as possible and in the most effective way possible which is really very important because you might uh, stop hemorrhaging in by doing something very specific 
that doesn't really help him deal with the root problem that he has. Uh, so so to, to, to create this social awareness, which God has, of course, God knows even what we're thinking, like you mentioned earlier, but to be able to, 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 to try to understand what these people are going through, what is it that's really causing them to get into financial trouble and to help them with their root causes, like in Ruth's beautiful example of, you know, understanding that it's just really hard for him to get a job and that the best way to help him get a job is just give him one so that he has references afterwards, you know, or, um, you know, or like Lily mentioned, having someone who's a mentor for him and is able to help him understand how the financial system works. You know, you might give a person money and then he doesn't know what to do with it. <clears throat> and he's going to be right back and maybe even further down the slope. So that's so important to really understand what the person needs and to address those needs as soon as possible. How far do you go? That was one of your other questions that you asked. Well, I, I think it's very, very interesting uh, how all of these commandments are designed not just to create a personal responsibility for those that are near you, but to also create the kind of community responsibility that Lily was talking about and Ruth was talking about. In other words, if we don't create a community sense of re mutual responsibility, it becomes very difficult to solve these problems because no single person can really solve all the problems. But if you really cultivate that kind of communal responsibility, a sense, I know in Jewish law, for example, that there, uh, every community had to have a Beit Tamchui. I don't know how to translate that exactly. Uh, soup, soup kitchen. kitchen. Uh, soup kitchen. Uh, it's kind of some kind of a soup kitchen that was with, with, with clear guidelines to make sure that nobody in the community would go hungry, that there would always, you know, be food for, 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 for everyone. And uh, I think a lot of these other laws that we just talked about, you know, are there to really make sure that when we do chesed, when we do charity, that we do it in the way that's uh, not embarrassing to the person, in a way that's effective in terms of what his fruit needs are. So there are all kinds of community related uh, laws that are designed to make this a community effort. If we can, part of the problem, by the way, with the government-based effort is that uh, a lot of people can get lost because the government can't possibly know what's really going on in that person's life and how to best help them and they can't deal with everyone. And the bottom line really is that the closer you are to the person who is needy, the more you can really help them because you're there. So it's so important that <clears throat> we don't just say, okay, I pay taxes and the government is supposed to do this, um, that, it, that, that we really sense that family, that the sense of family, that we really want family. And whenever somebody is, needs some, some help uh, within the family, it's the family responsibility to help that person figure out how uh, to be able to realize the gift that he has because every single one of us has a gift maybe even more than one gift and god wants us to use that gift yeah. in his service and helping each person find identify his gift and learn how to realize it uh as a free person not as somebody who's as a master telling you what to do but as a person who really does it autonomously because that's what he wants to do that is really the ultimate uh, goal uh, of, of this kind of a community. So what about the people that keep going uh, down the slope, no matter what you do? Mm. There are people who keep on making the wrong choice. But that, you see, that's, that's why I, I, I stressed before that sometimes helping a person in a way that doesn't help that, that, that that solves his, his, his current problem, but does not really help him improve. Like Lily mentioned a beautiful example of somebody who was, so you find someone who takes him under your wing. We have an Aliyah center here in the community. Every first family that makes Aliyah gets an adopting family. The adopting family's responsibility is uh, not just to help them figure out what's going on, 
but to actually try to understand what 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 this what this Aliyah family needs, and to galvanize others in the community to be able to address that need. It's there has to be that sense of we are not just here to solve an instant problem, yeah, but we have to right. really help them. And it it takes a village. I don't think that you know yes. one person can can solve this other person's problem, and, but a whole community together can certainly do a lot. I, th I think, yeah. Ruth, I think your question is also kind of the answer to the question that you, you asked right in the beginning. Right in the beginning, you said that this is, you feel this is like, you know, selling your, you know, being slave and so on. And, you know, may maybe that's the question, may meaning maybe somebody who is, who is, you know, his situation is so bad, he's not being able to, you know, to, to do better for himself. Eventually, he is sold as, as a slave to his fellow Jewish person. And he sees that, you know, finally he has some kind of base. You know, maybe it's not so bad because it's all those rules of how he's being treated. So he wants to stay, right? Which is, you know, for us, that sounds ridiculous. Why, would, why on earth would somebody want to stay a slave if he can get free? But, you know, maybe if it's, if it's somebody that is, you know, keep going down again and again and again, and finally he found a good home with a good master. So maybe, you know, maybe there is a reason for him to stay a slave. And even that master knows that he's got six years to fix it, right? <laughs> <laughs> because after six years, he's got to let, he's got to make sure that he leaves. It was like to stop that slippery slope. It's like Hashem understands this, of course, he created us, the psychology of, of humanity and that like there's there's depression, um, this feeling of, of loneliness, of worthlessness. If, if you've worked really hard and you've failed and you're in poverty and then if you are helped too much, like you were just saying, exactly, people start to feel entitled and it's like, why would I go back to work when the government is giving me this much money so uh, every month to just like not go to work so it's uh yeah it's that balance and like helping people early on that's what it seems like the torah is teaching us to prevent that slippery slope from happening and people to get to that place of despair or entitlement and uh, either either side of that coin is is very destructive to the person, to their family, and to the the rest of society. And I think it's really amazing that Hashem, right here in this Torah portion, like all of this is tied into the whole discussion about the Yovel, the Jubilee year, where it's like there is in the Torah. If Israel was completely living by the Torah, there is no space for. Um, generational poverty there's like no family will be stuck generation after generation after generation in poverty there there are systems in place for people to help their 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 brother help their relatives and if if their immediate relative can't help them then it's the next person and the next person in the community that's supposed to step in to help them get out of whatever situation they're in and then um the the person will be freed after and their family will be freed uh when the yovel year comes along and i think that's a really powerful lesson and how we apply that today that's a really good question uh, but uh, i think it's uh something that we should hopefully strive for you bring that family values i mean here taking the the case of naomi's husband the outcome was that his sons married uh, girls who, who were Moabites. Um, totally different culture. Um, happily Ruth um, made a choice, made a right choice in, in Danish, which was a girl as opposed to a boy. And there's different, uh, just to like clarify, there are different um, like definitions of, of ger, like ger is like sojourner, kind of outsider or something. So there, there's ger where someone that 
outside has come in, like you were just saying, Chris, like Ruth, that uh, chose to join the Jewish people, you would call a convert in modern English. And, um, and so those sort of gerim are considered to be completely part of Israel, like one of, um, one of the Jewish, completely one with the Jewish people. Uh, as you can see in the Torah and other places where it's like they can partake in the Pesach offering, uh, which, which um, a, a, diff, a sojourner who has not joined themselves with the Jewish people, not become part of Israel, um, would not. And then there's, I think in this instance, in this Torah portion, Ger is relating to that, that sojourner, that person who is living in Israel, and, but they're, they're not part of the Jewish people. So I think it's important to make that dis distinction as we're, um, as we're talking about like these sort of relationships, uh, especially when it comes to like family and, and caring for people in society. But thinking about that, like this whole discussion, we're saying that whole idea of family and clan and everything, it's, you definitely do have that much more in your psyche here, like down in your soul really here in Israel than at least I've felt it since I moved here compared to back in America. Like in America, you know, Jews are moving all over the place. When I lived in Boston, many people were just completely transitory there for a little while because they were going to medical school or whatever else. And they were there for a couple of years doing the residency at a hospital or something, and then they were gone and going someplace else. And so, but, but here in Israel, when a Jew is home and settled here in the land, there, there is this connection with your fellow Jew that's so much deeper here at home than there is outside. Like j just one example, my, my wife and I took our kids to a nearby town, it's called a uh, city called Carmiel. And uh, we were at this really big park there. And this woman was there with her children and she was sitting next to us on the bench with her baby in the stroller. And she just looked at us and said, could you watch in Hebrew? Could you watch my child? I have to go find my other kids. Just like not even, th and that happens all the time in Israel with the Jewish community. You're just like, people will just randomly ask you here, hold my baby or take care of my child because you're a fellow Jew. And I know you're gonna take care of my kid because we're family. I need to go <laughs> find my other kids or something to that effect. It just permeates, especially we just had Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaTzma'ut. Uh, it's really Memorial Day. We remember our fallen soldiers and victims of terror is right before our Independence Day. They're completely linked. And everyone, every single community, um, you know, has some sort of connection uh, for, for Memorial Day. And like here in our own town, the, we, we go to the, the graveyard outside of the town and there, there are two young men that two sons of people that live here that, that died because of, uh, um, while they were in, uh, serving in the, in the IDF, in the army. And you have like Memorial Day in, at least for America, it was, it's another day for like sales, you know, it was, <laughs> It was just all we saw on the Memorial Day when we were back in America. It was just like, hey, we have another sale this weekend where it's just so you really connect on that deeper family level with your fellow Jew here. And um, and even like people that I've met that aren't Jewish since I've moved here. You know, I've met some Christians that are here. Uh, I, I, whenever I hear English in the supermarket, it's just kind of like, oh, hey, I wonder <laughs> who these people are that are speaking English. And um but it doesn't matter like what country the people are from, what background they're from. There's, there's just something about that, uh, that connection here, especially people who aren't Jewish. If they come here to visit, it does, it's not cheap to come here to Israel. And they've taken their time and their money to come here for whatever reason. And that's, that's a really powerful, amazing thing. And that, that alone creates such a connection. So, um, so yeah, I think, uh, please God, I hope that those lessons here from, from Israel and those family community connections can expand out to the rest of the world. These biblical principles will be seen throughout the whole world.
My take is that uh, taking interest from basically the relative, that's essentially what we're talking about within the Jewish community, is about profiting from somebody else's dire situation, hmm. being in the straits, so to speak, right? So I think there's an ethical issue about profiting from somebody else's problem. I think that's why we don't take the interest. But at the same time, the person who receives the loan is expected to pay it back, uh, subject to the Shemitah cycle, okay? Uh, and there are various mechanisms, I understand, in Jewish law that deal with at what point in the Jewish cycle you are that and how much you have to pay off and how much you are allowed to loan within that Shemitah cycle. Um, so I think uh, it's about pro it's, a, it's about avoiding uh, profiting from somebody else's bad fortune, and that's an ethical principle. Yeah, I think the ethical principle uh, for a brother who's in the straits, who's poor or depressed, you know, going into the translational word there, uh, there is a moral duty, I think, for every person to release the good stuff. That God has put in them into the world. And so we have, and that's where we have to hold each other accountable to that, where we have to be releasing our skills, we have to be releasing our capacities, we have to be releasing our knowledge, we have to be releasing our creativity, we have to be using what God has put into us that benefits others, we have to be releasing that. And if we come into a place where we're getting blocked up and we're not able to release that, that's a moral problem. That's an, that's an ethical problem as written. If, if I'm in an emotional state where I feel like I don't have anything to offer or I can't contribute, that, that's a problem state of mind that needs to be challenged. And as a family, as a community, we have to challenge that in each other. Yeah. You know, the principle of the Shemitah and the Yovel to prevent creation of pharaohs and Putins. Right. Hmm. Yeah. So no. Yeah. Now it's a good point. It's like this leveling, right? It's like a knockdown. Yeah. Levels it out, and then you get yeah. to kind of rebuild, you know, the different, and then it knocks down. And yeah. it. <laughs> right. Right. Does right. The story of Joseph play a part here at all with um, accumulating grain in Egypt and coming to the point of selling it back to the Egyptians. After all, it was their grain. And then they had to sell their land and their cattle. And Pharaoh grew richer and richer. Right. Pharaoh ended up owning all that property. Yeah, and big fat cattle. Yeah. In Egypt. Right. But we came out of Egypt. And we're not supposed to be like Egypt. <laughs> Count, counting right. the Oma. Mm -hmm. right. Part of the reason why we left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. It's yeah. a transition between Egypt and Sinai. Wow, Chris, that's a really amazing point you bring up about how, yeah, the Yovel, the Jubilee year prevents any like one person or like a small group of people who are extremely wealthy from gobbling everything up and then keeping it from everyone else. Like that really makes me think of like my wife and I, we had to leave the community, the Orthodox Jewish community in Boston at one point because uh, what was happening in Boston, probably still happening right now, is that all the residential areas um, where where the Orthodox community is, uh, just just outside of Boston, they like these big companies kept on buying stuff up and buying stuff up, tearing down houses and putting up these really big uh, buildings, apartments in order to uh, prevent like individual ownership, and so you just have the could maximize wealth, especially since there are so many colleges and universities around. There are just people coming in and out, especially foreign exchange students, where their parents are just like paying the full amount for the the rent for the um, the cost of the college and everything. And then there's no financial aid in that situation. So the colleges and these huge contracting companies uh, keep on getting richer and richer. Meanwhile, the the cost of living gets higher and higher and like all the whole community just like starts getting dispersed because no one can afford to stay there anymore, especially with people with, uh, with a number of children. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a really good point that you brought up how that the Yovel prevents 
that from happening. Yep. All right, everybody. We have to go home now. <laughs> <laughs>